Welcome to Expound, our weekly worship and verse-by-verse study of the Bible. Our goal is to expand your knowledge of the truth of God by explaining the Word of God in a way that is interactive, enjoyable, and congregational. We call this a textual community. Let's rejoice and learn God's Word in an interactive and enjoyable new way. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. We want to cover ground tonight, and so uh, we want to get right into it. Let's pray together. Father, we're here because we believe that this is important to our lives. We have made a conscious choice to be here in the middle of the week to give you our time as an act of our worship. In our worship, we have told you by our songs that you're the Lord, that we're surrendered to your care and your rule in our lives. Some of us have cried out deeply because of deep issues going on. Others have rejoiced in song because you've been so good to them lately. But you know us, Lord, and we're confident and we're comfortable in your presence. But we're also here with other people. Hence, there is an accountability to our statement of faith in being here. And in being with other people, we're enjoying fellowship, which is more than just, hi, how are you? That fellowship started long before this meeting started formally, and it will occur once we're dismissed. We pray for deep, intimate ties to develop between members of the body of Christ so there is genuine community. And Lord, as we're gathered together, we make the commitment that you have our complete attention, and we do not want to be a distraction to anyone by our moving around during a study. We're we're here to say we need to hear from you, and we pray that you'd speak to us through your word, simply the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. It's estimated that about 90 percent of the seven billion people that live on planet Earth are very religious. That's all of the religious belief systems together. Very religious. If you were to look up religion in a dictionary, you'd get a definition something like a system of beliefs and practices that include devotional and ritual observances. I think that comes out of Webster. But there's something else about religion that we have discovered, and that is there's a dark side to religion. There's an abusive side to religion. Every religious system has in its history or in its practice some pretty despicable things, including the church historically. When we look back to the 11th and 12th centuries, and we think about the Crusades under the direction of the papacy who sent thousands upon thousands of warriors over to butcher those who were not believers, to kill Jewish and Muslim people. For a couple of hundred years, We have to deal with that. That's a blatant abuse that is totally against the Scripture. That's a dark spot of religion. If we were to look at Islam, there is a radical element in Islam that comprises multiple millions of people around the world that believe in Slaughter, mass suicide, killing infidels, all in the name of jihad. It is not isolated. It is widespread. It is pandemic. And I believe it's the next biggest thing this world is going to wrestle with. 
The Jehovah Witnesses have kept their members from engaging in blood transfusions because of their belief system that is unbiblical, but many have died because of those abuses. So religion has its dark side, its abusive side. And then we also have to think that in Judaism, 2,000 years ago, the very era that we are studying in the New Testament, were groups of religious people, religious leaders, who were so opposed to Christ, they had one thing on their minds only, and that is kill him and get him out of our hair in the name of their religion. I find it interesting to see how Jesus deals with religious people. To the prostitute, to the one who's the overt sinner and knows it, there's a compassion and tenderness with Christ. To the religious leader who's a hypocrite, he has no mercy. He spares or minces no words. His approach is direct with all the authority of heaven, placing those religious leaders in the category of being bound for hell. It is quite daunting and instructing to see how Jesus deals with them. Let me tell you basically what religion is and see how different it is from Christ. Religion is basically me coming to God on my terms. I decide, I like that approach to God. I like that flavor of belief system. I'll, I'll do that. It kind of fits in with what I want. It's me coming to God on my terms. God will have none of it. He has spelled out the terms. He has revealed to man what those terms are. He has taken care of the problem, which is sin that separates us from God. And he has demanded that all men and women come through Christ his Son only in repentance and faith or be forever damned. You go, that's harsh. Really? All you have to do is believe and trust in the finished work of Christ. How is that hard for you? It was hard for him. He's the one that had to sacrifice. Jesus is the one that had to come. He had to put up with that pain. And God says, I've eliminated the roadblocks. Come and be saved. And whoever believes in him will be saved. Something else about religious systems, and we discover it now, and hence the introduction, I won't make this long. In every religious system, there are divisions, right? There's always in every religion a conservative branch of that religious system and a liberal branch and many branches in between. The conservative or the fundamental group, and I unashamedly am a narrow-minded fundamentalist. I'm proud of that. I don't think narrow-minded in the biblical sense, only in if you take the wide sense of the liberal view that there are many ways to God, then you're going to see me as a very narrow-minded fundamentalist. I happen to believe what God said in his word is true, that there's only one true God, not 15. There's only one, and there's only one way to God, and that's through Christ. That's what I believe. I would be labeled as a fundamentalist. I wear that proudly. I don't, I don't mind it. However, I understand that in my camp, there are those under the conservative name, the fundamental name, that can be and have been very abusive and legalistic and turned a lot of people off. But I digress. There is also the liberal side. Bible is not the word of God. You can't trust it. Let's just all come up with he God or she God or it God or there may be a God. Let's have a building where we can have potluck dinners and uh, bury people and do weddings, and that's Christianity. In Judaism, there were also these divisions. There was, on one hand, the narrow, fundamental, conservative Pharisees. We've dealt with them. And another group on the liberal camp called the Sadducees, and that's the group we deal with tonight. Now, the Sadducees were the polar opposites of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were radical ritualists and legalists. 
The Sadducees were rationalists. They did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in angels. They did not believe in spirits. They did not believe in the Old Testament except the first five books of Moses. They were anti-supernatural. They were very wealthy, aristocratic, and happened to have control of the temple for hundreds of years. We better get into the text or we'll be lost. Verse 23, Matthew 21, no, 22, pardon me. The same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers, the first died after he had married, having no offspring, left his wife to his brother, likewise the second also, and the third even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Do you get this picture? There are seven boys in a family. The eldest marries. He dies, doesn't have children. Then all of these brothers marry her, and you go, why on earth would they do that? they're dealing with. Well, first of all, let me back up. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, right? Remember that? So they're trying to come up with a story to illustrate how ridiculous the idea is of a resurrection. And here's the story. Now, they're appealing to a law in the portion of the Bible they believe in, the first five books of Moses, the Torah, the Pentateuch, and they're citing a passage in Deuteronomy which is called the Law of Leveret Marriage. Let me spell that for you. L-E-V-I-R-A-T-E, Leveret Marriage, which says that if a family, a boy has a wife and they don't have children and he dies, that to raise up seed for his dead brother the next brother would provide that service for his dead brother and his surviving wife. Why was that ever enacted, you're thinking? You're going, that's kind of weird. It was to preserve that man's name in Israel and to keep the tribal allotments of the land under that name in perpetuity. That's what it was all about, the preservation of the name and the tribes. This is a story that is ridiculous based upon a law in the Bible. A law, by the way, that was practiced. If you want to know if this ever really worked, it did work in the case of Ruth and Boaz. That's what that was all about. Do you remember the story of Ruth and Boaz? Remember, there was a guy named Elimelech who had a wife named Naomi, and they fell into poverty, and so they went across the Dead Sea to Moab, and. The two boys, Melon and Chilion, married Moabitess women, and then the two boys died, and Ruth came back over with Naomi to the land of Israel. And because they own land, but the husband was dead, the only way to get redemption or to bring the land back under Israel was for a relative, a kinsperson, a kinsman, to marry Ruth and be able to buy the land. Remember there was a relative who was closer than Boaz. He said, I don't want that job. I'm married, I've got a family, not gonna do it. Boaz was able to do it and he paid for the land and he married Ruth. That's all in Deuteronomy, the law of leveret marriage. So these Sadducees, and they're really sad, you, you can see, you see. Um, they don't believe in the supernatural, don't believe in a resurrection, don't believe in angels, don't believe in spirits. So they're coming up with this story of, hey, we have a real problem to show how ridiculous the idea of a resurrection is. Now, I'll show you why. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, which they don't believe in, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. And Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken. I love the King James. You are ignorant. <laughs> There's some translations that you just can't improve on. 
And in this section, the King James nails it. You are ignorant, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He says they will be like the angels. In other words, they will be deathless. They are immortal. The Sadducees do not believe in angels. Jesus says, well, here's the truth. When people die, they are like the angels. They are eternal. They have no death. That's one of the points he is making. So here is a scripture that has caused many people anxiety, where it says, in heaven there's neither marriage nor are people given in marriage. I remember a gal who hated this scripture, hated it. She was so looking forward to being married, and she was, the years were climbing up on her, and she so wanted to get married, and she was serious with this one guy, and she found this scripture, and I remember she, she came to me. I, I wasn't even married at that point. I was single, but I was in that state, and at that time very content, but she said, I don't like this scripture. She goes, probably what's going to happen is the Lord's going to come back and then I won't be married or I'll just get married, just being joined by married life, and then the Lord will come back and all my happiness is gone. Yeah, that's right. You're going to go to heaven forever. Yeah, it kind of blows it all, doesn't it? <laughs> that was her thinking. She was mad because in heaven there's neither marriage nor given in marriage. On the other hand, I've met other people who are quite comforted by this scripture. <laughs> And I always worry when as a married couple, all they can talk about is, man, I can't wait till I get to heaven. I can't wait till I get to heaven. <laughs> Notice, first of all, Jesus doesn't say that when people die, they become angels after the resurrection. Why am I bringing that up? I'm actually, I have been surprised at how many people I've run into who say, well, we know what happens when you die, you turn into an angel, you get your wings from some dumb old movie in the past and <laughs> warped belief system by people who never read a, a page of Scripture. It doesn't say you turn into angels. You don't. You become deathless and you become without the need to propagate like you do on earth. We propagate the earth. Um, there's the need to procreate. And so God put that within humanity. In heaven, in eternity, there's no need. We're, we're eternal beings. That's number one. Number two, Jesus is dealing with people who don't believe in angels or a resurrection, so he's going to prove that there is a resurrection. He's going to shut their mouths, and in just a couple of sentences, far more than I'm even using, he's going to button their lip to prove to them there is a resurrection. Now, they believe in how many books? Five, the first five books of Moses. So he's going to quote from one of the books they believe in. Watch what he does. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, verse 31, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He's quoting Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. God is speaking to Moses in that passage. At that moment, when God speaks to Moses, Abraham is dead, Isaac is dead, Jacob is dead. All the patriarchs are dead. Jesus says, have you not read the text carefully where God the Father speaks in the present tense, not the past tense? He doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I am, present tense, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See what he's doing? Because God wouldn't speak of people who have had their physical demise hundreds of years past and speak in the present tense, because when you speak in the present tense and you say, I am the God of Abraham, it denotes that those people are still alive. There's a present tense relationship with them. And once a person is dead, you never speak in the present tense. You speak in the past tense. God was speaking in the present tense to prove to the Pharisees in the scripture they believed in that there is a resurrection because God said, I, in the present state, have a relationship with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, even though they have died long ago. Isn't that brilliant? 
So watch what happens. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. The Sadducees said nothing because they could say nothing. There's no comeback at all. It's an open, shut, logical case. And the people went, wow. He turned those Sadducees on their ear, put them in their place in a short few sentences. But, verse 34, when the Pharisees heard that he silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Oh, club meeting. We got to get together on this one. We're in trouble. Then one of them, a lawyer, I will say nothing. <laughs> I'm looking out and I'm seeing attorneys that I know, so I'm going to say nothing. No, I won't do it. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, can I just pause for a moment and let you know something that that lawyer was thinking? He was a lawyer. He was a religious lawyer. And he knew the law, meaning the law of Moses, which was not only a religious law, but a social law that governed the country. As a lawyer at that time, the Jews believed in not one commandment or two commandments or ten commandments. You know how many they had? 613 commandments. 248 were positive, 365 were negative. It's a lot of commandments to say which is the best of all of them. As time went on, the Jews corresponded the 248 positive commandments with the 248 portions of the human body. And since the calendar changed from 360 days per year in the Babylonian calendar to 365 days per year in the Julian calendar, what the Jews will tell you is the reason God gave 613 commandments, 248 positive, 365 negative, is so that you will worship him with all of your being, 248, 365 days of the year. It's a beautiful thought, but it's a bit of a stretch. So keep in your mind that that was in his mind when he says, Jesus, as a lawyer, I have a question for you. Which is the greatest of all the commandments? Now watch what he says. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, or all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now, if you know anything about Judaism, you know that's the basic affirmation of faith. It's called the Shema, Shema Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God, and this is quoted. That's the heart of it all. So Jesus says that. And the second is like it, now quoting Leviticus 19, verse 18. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What a statement. We've talked about it before, don't want to elaborate on it now, except to say he's taken all the positive, all the negative, the Ten Commandments and all the ones they added and said, you can sum them up by two things. Love God with everything in you and love your neighbor as yourself. If you look at the Ten Commandments, which you don't have to now, but you know what they are, there are ten of them. The first four superintend your relationship to God. It's all about what you do in relationship to Him. So they're vertical in their nature, vertical in axis. You're dealing with God in the first four commandments. The second six commandments deal horizontally, person to person, man to man. So summing up the Ten Commandments as well, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Because you see, if you do that, you won't break any of those Ten Commandments. If you love the Lord your God, you're not going to take his name in vain. If you love the Lord your God, you're going to honor him with at least one day per week, if not every day. You're going to honor him with your very substance, your finances. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to covet, you're not going to steal, you're not going to kill because you love. So Jesus aptly sums up the entire old covenant law by love at the heart. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 
you fast forward to the New Testament book of Matthew, which we're in, but go back to the Sermon on the Mount, which we have, we remember that Jesus takes the law a bit further, does he not? And say it doesn't just govern what you do, but what you feel, what you think. Not just your action, but your attitude. You say, Skip, how does he do that? By saying this, you have heard that it was said by those of old, you shall not commit murder. But I say to you, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. And he takes the law into the very heart of a man and says it begins, sin begins, deep within the heart before an action is ever committed. And the law of God, according to Jesus, was meant not just to govern your actions, but your attitude. That's why Paul the Apostle in the book of Romans said, you know, I used to look at the law and I felt pretty good about the law and I was a law keeper until I got to the commandment that says you shall not covet. And then I thought, I'm dead meat. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Because now, Paul said, I realize that the law is governing something that I'm thinking and feeling. That's what coveting is. It's not an outward, overt action. That it's not just external, it's internal. And he said, I was slayed by it. I've broken the command. I've broken the law of God. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what do you think about the Christ, that is the Messiah, the anointed one? That's what the word means. What do you think about the Christ, Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, son of David. He said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Let me quickly explain that. The most common messianic term for the Jews was and is the son of David. Ask a Jew, who is the Messiah? The son of David. He's going to come and be the son of David. Now, why would they call the Messiah the son of David? Because God gave David a promise in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And he said, Your descendant will sit upon your throne forever and ever. That's the promise. Now, here's the question. Who would God be referring to when he says, Your descendant will sit upon the throne, your throne, David, forever and ever? Can't be Solomon. Solomon was his son, but Solomon died, and his kingdom wasn't perpetual. Moreover, when Solomon died, the kingdom split into two with Jeroboam and Rehoboam, southern kingdom and northern kingdom. Moreover, those two kingdoms were displaced by foreign powers, Israel in 722 B.C. by Assyria, Judah, the two southern tribes in 586 B.C. by the Babylonians. There was an ad admixture of the tribes, so today people can't even tell what tribe they're from. So if God made a promise to David that his descendant will sit upon the throne, can't be Solomon, he's dead, the kingdom was split, who could it be referring to? They said it's got to refer to the Messiah. The Messiah will come and unite our nation as the son of David. So they believed, here's the belief system, the Messiah will be a human being only, not a divine being like we know Jesus is, but a human descendant of David. So that's the question. Um, the Christ, whose son is he? The son of David. Jesus said, so you've got a problem. Because David himself said in the spirit, notice the text, verse 44, he's quoting Psalm 110. Here it is. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. If David in the spirit called the Messiah, his Lord, then how can he be David's son? David wouldn't call a mere human descendant of his, his Lord. Adonai is the word. Now that is a quandary. That's a puzzle that they can't answer. There's only one answer to it. The reason David called him Lord is because that Messiah will be both divine and human. They couldn't get their minds around that. But you understand where Jesus is coming from. How then could David call him in the spirit, Psalm 110, Lord? 
And no one, verse 46, love this, no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did they dare question him anymore. That's wisdom. You have to have lots of wisdom to shut lots of different arguments and mouths in a quick period of time to get that reaction. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes. Now he's directing the people who have gathered around listening. And he said, and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to do, observe. To observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. When he said they sit in Moses' seat, he meant when they teach the law of God, they have authority. Moses' seat, the chair from which they speak, I've told you before that Rabbi sat in a message and typically people stood. If we wanted to get really messianic here, I'd have you stand for the whole message and I would be seated because the chair was the place of authority. Today, the Catholics say the Pope speaks ex cathedra from the chair. Professors hold a chair of philosophy at a university. It's a place of authority. They sit in Moses' seat. They, they teach with Moses' authority. Listen to what they teach in as much as they're teaching the Scripture, but don't live like they live. They're high on talk, but they're low on walk. Their creed is good. Their preaching is good. Their practice is abominable. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Abusive religious system, legalism. Let me give you an example. Listen to this. You'll find this interesting. If you were to cull through the Old Testament law and find out how much the Old Testament says about keeping the Sabbath, you'd find a few paragraphs total. That's it. A few paragraphs about what the Sabbath means and what you don't do and what you should do on the Sabbath. If you go to the Mishnah, the Jewish Mishnah, you said, I don't know what a Mishnah is. A Mishnah was the redacted written form of the oral law. It's when they took the oral law and put it into writing. That's the Mishnah. 24 chapters on keeping the Sabbath. If you then go to the codified commentaries of the Jews called the Talmud, 156 large double folio pages on the Sabbath. Because to them it wasn't enough when it says, don't do any work on the Sabbath, don't bear a burden on the Sabbath. They would say, but, but what is a burden? <laughs> We've got to get the lawyers and the scribes and the heavyweights together to determine what that means. And they had long and drawn out descriptions of what it means to keep or not keep the Sabbath. Because we have to decide if it's okay for you to lift a lamp on the Sabbath. Maybe that's a burden. Or put a brooch on a woman or wear dentures. This is all part of those writings. I kid you not. So they said a burden is anything more than food enough equal in weight to a dried fig. Milk enough for a single swallow. Oil enough to anoint one member of your body two or ink enough that would write two letters on a piece of paper. If you do that or exceed that, you're bearing a burden, you're breaking the Sabbath. They even would argue endlessly over these things, and there's even this large section in these writings I'm telling you about, about what do we do if you have a hen that lays an egg on the Sabbath? Oh man, that's just so heavy, man. That's such a, I got a huge problem. I made a big deal out of it. You're Jewish, you can't break the Sabbath, but you have a hen, and your hen has laid an egg on the Sabbath. Now, if, if you were to do that and you can't, that would be considered work. So your hen has worked on the Sabbath. You can't eat that egg. But you don't want to lose the profit from that egg. So what do we do? And you know what their solution was? Sell it to a Gentile. 
you'll recoup the loss, they'll enjoy the egg, they're not under the law, they're not part of God's covenant, you've solved your problem. Now, do you understand what Jesus means when he says, you bind heavy burdens hard to bear and you lay them on men's shoulders? Now, he's just getting warmed up. But all their works they do to be seen by men, they make their phylacteries broad and they enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best seats at the feasts, the best seats at the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace to be called by men, rabbi, which means great one, rabbi, rabbi. You see the word phylacteries? I bet some of you have read that and you said, there's a weird word here, I don't even know how to pronounce it, and I certainly don't know what it means. A phylactery is a wooden box covered with leather. Really, it's a leather box, but it can be wood covered with leather. It's about yay big. Jewish men tie these wooden boxes on their forehead and on their left arm just above the elbow when they pray. You go, why do they do that? Because inside those boxes are passages of Scripture, two passages from the book of Exodus, two passages from the book of Deuteronomy. They tie these passages, the law, on their head and on their arm when they pray. Those are phylacteries. You go, well, why do they tie boxes on their arms when they pray with Scriptures inside? Because they over-literalize some of their own writings. Now, you don't have to turn there. If you want to make a note of it, I'll tell you where I'm reading from. Exodus chapter 13. Let me just read it to you. He's talking about keeping the day of uh, unleavened bread. Unleavened bread, verse 7, shall be eaten seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen among you. Leavened bread shall not be seen among you and all your quarters. And then it says, you shall tell your son in that day, saying, this is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up out of Egypt. It shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth, for with a strong hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. So they have read this scripture and, in my opinion, over-literalized it and said, God must mean that he wants us to make little boxes to put the scripture inside of our, the box so it's right in front of me. I can see it. It's, it's what I... It's, it's, the very pinnacle of my body, my head, and on my arm, because it says arm. The reason I have a problem with that and say that it's over-literalizing it because they left out a part of the verse that I just read. It says, that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. (laughs) I, I see none of them chewing on a little parchment of Scripture or having a little box in their mouth because that's not the meaning of the text. The meaning of the text is simply that you handle it, that you think about it, and that you speak about it. That's the idea. And it's a part of your very being. It's a part of your very fiber. The law is to be what governs you. It's to be before you continually. It's the most important part that you adhere your lifestyle to the commandments of God. That's what it means. Some of the Pharisees would take and mock, make their boxes bigger. Because the bigger the box, the more you notice the box. I mean, if you saw a man today from the Wailing Wall here on this platform at Calvary of Albuquerque, you'd go, what's up with the dude with the box on his head? (laughs) And then you go to Israel and you say, oh, there's thousands of them with boxes on their heads and on their arms. But if you see somebody with a little bigger box, then you're going to think, that guy might be a little more spiritual than that guy. He has a bigger box on his head. They would make their phylacteries broad. They would make them bigger so you would notice them. That's what Jesus was referring to. And he says, enlarge the borders of their garments. Did you know that the Jewish male wore a fringe on the bottom of his robes called tzitzit? Can you say that? Tzitzit, that's the Hebrew word, tassels, tzitzit. And the tzitzit, the tassels, were at the border of the garment, and the Lord said in Numbers, weave a blue thread into those tassels, which presumably spoke of heaven to show that you're God's people to be set apart for heavenly spiritual things. But if you're really spiritual, perhaps you'll have a little bit longer tassel than the other guy. Now, Jesus isn't down on phylacteries per se or tassel per se. After all, it's my opinion that Jesus wore those tassels. Matthew 9 talks about the woman touching the hem of his garment. 
It's that word, it's that tassel she was trying to grab, what the Jewish male wore at the bottom of his garment, the tzitzit, he, she was trying to grab it and say, I'll be healed. But the point is, they were focusing on the boxes and the tassels, that is the externals and not the heart. That's what he's always after, right? Always the heart, always the inside, not the religious ritualistic observances. They love the best seats at the feast, best seats in the synagogue. In the synagogues, in front of a box called the Ark where the Torah scrolls were, was a bench that faced the congregation. Those were the noble seats. That's where they sat. And he says, greeting in the marketplaces. Certain titles feed our ego and intimidate other people. If we met for the first time and I said, you introduce yourself and I said, well, my name's Skip. I've given you my first name. But if I say, my name is Dr. Reverend, Most Holy Reverend, <laughs> Skip, <laughs> which is an oxymoron. Doesn't it sound that way? <laughs> Immediately, I have fed my ego, and I've intimidated you. The point Jesus will make, and I should just let him make it, is that in the body of Christ, there is a brotherhood, a sisterhood, and no one should have divisions that bring anyone else higher or lower. We're all at the same level at the cross. But they love to have their egos fed, Rabbi. And when, when people call me reverend, I will often correct them gently, but I'll say, appreciate that, but I am no reverend. You're not? I heard you were a pastor, reverend. I go, no, I'm not a reverend. And here's the reason. In the scripture, there is only one time the word reverend is used, and it's used for God alone. I don't like to take anything that is reserved for God to myself. If there is to be a proper title for me, is a slave. I'm a slave. I'm a servant. Paul and Timothy, slaves of Jesus Christ. I serve him and I serve you, the body of Christ, for his sake, my king. No doctor, no reverend, no holy father. Slave. Verse 8, you shall not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, ouch, in other words, you're not going to heaven, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte or convert, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools, blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. Now, if you can believe it, they divided vows up in two camps, binding and non-binding, obligatory and non-obligatory. If you were to swear by the temple, didn't have to keep it. If you swore by the gold of the temple, you had to keep it. If you swore by the empty altar, didn't have to keep it, non-obligatory. If you swore by that which is on the altar, the ornateness of it, it was obligatory. The point Jesus is making is you love gold more than you love God because you have taken and made up a commandment but the value system that is embedded in your commandment reveals your heart. Verse 18, And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on it is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? 
Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Real quickly, those aromatic spices that are mentioned were very common. But the law in the Old Testament that governed the tithe of your produce, you know, you had to give a tenth of your grain and a tenth of your oil. The laws in the Old Testament that governed the tithing of your produce were never intended to govern those small aromatic spices. And yet, get this, some of these Pharisees were so meticulous, history tells us they would count the tiny little cumin seeds one by one to make sure they've given a tenth to the Lord. Now, Jesus isn't saying that's the issue. That isn't the issue. If I might paraphrase it, Jesus would say, cool, I applaud your exactness. But in your exactness, you've left out the most important parts, and that is justice and mercy and faith. You should tithe. You should be responsible and worship God with your substance, but don't leave out the important stuff. That's his point. Blind guides, verse 24, who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. I'm glad you laughed. That means you're getting the sense of the text because I know that when Jesus said this, the crowds started laughing like crazy. That was a joke because the gnat is the smallest of the unclean animals in the Old Covenant. The camel is the largest of the unclean animals. And some of these religious nutcases would actually take their beverages and they would strain them through cloth because they didn't want to get a gnat and defile their mouth. So Jesus said, you strain out a gnat at the same time you're swallowing a camel because it's all about externals and nitpicky legalism. You've left out the real heart of the law. What are you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? You cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean. Who would want to drink from a nice dish on the outside? You look inside, it's all gnarly. You wouldn't drink from it. The inside's filthy. They're all about the externals. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but are inside full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. If you and I were to live 2,000 years ago and be on the roads that would trickle into Jerusalem on the Passover or Pentecost or any of the great feasts, you would notice that the roads have been newly redone to ease our travel, that the tombs by the sides of the road have been painted white, brilliant white, not just to look pretty, but to keep you and I from touching them accidentally because we would be ceremonially defiled. They paint them white to say, look, don't come near this. You can see this, can't you? It's white enough that anybody could see this, so it would keep away ceremonially, a ceremonial defilement. But you know what the picture is, right? You, you, you get that. You look good on the outside. Inside, you're full of death and decay. That's the point, like a tomb. What are you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt, serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Now, just let that soak in for a moment, shall we? 
You know who is speaking here? Incarnate love is speaking. Can incarnate love say such horrible, ghastly things? Absolutely, because they happen to be true. And telling the truth is one of the most loving things you could ever do to a person. Easiest thing to do to a person is, dude, you're awesome, man. We just think you're the best. When inside you're going, you're a creep. (laughs) Faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? To put your heart and your reputation at stake by doing this, that's love. Now, there is a misconception, and I want to nail this here before we quickly move on and close. There's a popular concept of Jesus that is not the biblical Jesus. It is the uh, Jesus, the great reformer, the guy who smiles at everything and would embrace any belief system and any practice at all and go, oh, well, it doesn't matter because I'm Jesus and everything's cool. The mild, meek reformer who lets anybody do whatever they want to because Jesus is all about love. And I can just say, really? If you think that, you've never been a parent. Because I remember spanking my son, and I bet you spanked your kids, and I remember, and you remember them saying, you don't love me. Why would you say that? Because you hit me. You spanked me. No, it's because I love you that I did. This is incarnate love speaking, and it's harsh, and it happens to be true. Jesus is pointing out that spiritually they are done. They are doomed for eternal hell because their hearts are so hardened they have not repented. They could turn, but they won't. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, scribes, some of them you kill and crucify, some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. This is not the Zechariah, the prophet in the Minor Prophets. This is Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, in 2 Chronicles 24, which happens to be the last book in the Hebrew Old Testament. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. All what things? Well, let's just get a little context here. He just cursed the fig tree, right? We saw that was a picture of the nation of Israel. He had been rejected. He's rejecting them nationally. He has just predicted in parable form that their city, the city of Jerusalem, will be burned by fire. If you just go back a few verses to verse 7 of chapter 22, um, look at that really quick. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. That's the parable. And now he says, all these things are going to happen to this generation. All these things that I predicted by cursing the fig tree, by giving you the parable, it's gonna happen to this generation. Now he's gonna be very explicit. Now comes some of the most moving portion of scripture to be found anywhere as Jesus laments, cries over the city. Verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. These are powerful words. They tell us, first of all, of the patience of God. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you. They tell us of the pleading of Jesus. I wanted to gather you like a hen gathers her children under a wing. I wanted so to nourish and protect you as the son of David is your Messiah. But it also tells us the power of choice. You are not willing. That to me is one of the Worst verses in the Bible because it brings out one of the gravest, worst truths in the Bible. You were not willing. 
It's as if he's saying, I am the doctor with the cure to your disease and you are about to die forever and you won't take the cure. You were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This has been a sobering chapter, and I don't know how to really change it by adding little stories and jokes and making light of it. It's meant to be powerful. Imagine how it sounded in its original form as Jesus addressed this crowd. I think people walked away going, whoa. I've never had a temple service like that before. That was weird. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, what Jesus saw as he wept over that city happened. I wonder if God today wouldn't be looking over America saying, America, America, how often I wanted to gather you, but you were not willing. Billy Graham used to say, if God does not judge America, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah a deep apology. America, America. Our founding fathers wanted one nation under God with a constitution written to ensure our freedom of worship, not freedom from worship. However, in modern times, politicians and revisionists have pushed God far out, pushed him far away. And honestly, and I say this not just because it could be a powerful statement, but I mean this sincerely, it could perhaps be too late for America. I personally believe we're not facing the judgment of God, we're under the judgment of God. There's a big difference. We're now experiencing as a nation, I believe, the judgment of God. Because according to Romans 1, the first step in God judging a person or a nation is that he gives them over to what they ask for. When they start asking for it and persisting and not wanting to retain God in their knowledge but push God out of their thinking, Romans 1, God gives them over to a reprobate mind to do anything they want to do and file any law they want to file, including killings of, killing of millions and millions of innocent children and upholding any union, civil union you want in the name of tolerance. God gives them over. And it could be that it is too late. One of the um, stark realities, if you're a prophecy student, any prophecy student knows that you know, the Bible has a lot to say about nations of the world like China, Iran. We know the future of Russia. We know the future of Egypt, Germany, Turkey, Israel. But prophecy buffs know that the United States is eerily absent from Bible prophecy. And they wonder, I always get asked that question, what does that mean? My answer is, I don't know. It could mean that we don't exist to any degree of importance at all by the time it all comes down. That we just completely sell out and we're overturned and we're not what we once were and we're, in my opinion, heading down that road. The other possibility, just to close it off because we're two minutes over and I will close. The other possibility is that there comes such an outpouring of mercy and there is such a widespread revival and repentance that we're not part of that end time judgment scenario. I hope it's number two. I pray and I labor day and night for number two. It's what I'm all about. But I fear that God is giving our nation over. So. Are you committed, as I am, that the rest of the breaths that you breathe as a, as a believer will be to get and herald the best message out to this world who is facing the same judgment that these religious leaders were facing and bringing to hell with them millions and millions of other people? And there's only one hope for that, and that's Jesus. If there wasn't, Jesus wouldn't have come, wouldn't have died, wouldn't have risen from the dead to give us hope. It's a dire message in these chapters. We are living in dire times. I look at it simply. Every, 
I'll stop right there. We're over time. Okay, I'll say it. I, I did, I did. Every subset of our society is encouraged to come out of the closet and be themselves and say who they are. Be vocal about who they are. People should accept you for who you are. So I'm just saying it's time for Christians to come out of the closet and not be ashamed of saying, I love Jesus. You got a problem with that? You don't like that? I don't really care if you like that or not. I'd rather please God and not be a man pleaser. If you, if you bow before God, you can stand before any human being. If you don't bow before God, you will be like the waves tossed to and fro and scared of everything. You can be bold, but stay low to the ground. Stay humble before your God and be bold. Father in heaven, tough, straightforward words directed by the words of Jesus, I have sought to uncover and unpack what Jesus himself said, not trying to overstep my bounds as an expositor. If I have, please adjust and forgive that. But Father, in keeping with your word, we pray now for an outpouring of your spirit on our nation, upon our community and our lives, that we would be whom you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.